What is up, Packers Nation? Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. And of course, you can follow the podcast at Pack-A-Day Podcast as well. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, give those five-star reviews. That is always greatly appreciated. Amazing show lined up for you today. I'm going to try to do my absolute best to bring you seven different possibilities in mock drafts for the first three rounds to try to build out the perfect Packers draft. Can I do it? We will find out. We will see. And I would love your evaluations of some of these drafts at the end, or at least maybe which one is your favorite. But we'll get into that in just a moment. Before we get there, shout out to our new Pack a Day podcast YouTube members, Josh Sajkowski. I hope I got that right. And Lindsay, thank you both for signing up. Also, this Friday, this freaking Friday, Timber Rattlers game. $10 ticket will get you into the game and to a live Q&A future featuring yours truly. We're going to do a bunch of draft questions, bunch of Packers questions. Should be a ton of fun. I will put the link in the description notes below. So if you are interested, make sure to sign up. Also, if you are a Packaday podcast member, I'm going to put in the community notes uh, a message that you can reply to. If you are interested in going to the Timber Rattlers game, I would like to purchase your tickets for you. So let me know. Now, if we get like a hundred or something, uh, that's probably not going to work, but either reply to me or email me uh, at packadaypodcast at gmail.com. And uh, I would like to hook you up with some tickets to that game. So if you are a Packaday Podcast member and you're interested in going to that game, shoot me an email or put a note in the messages and I will hook you up. And uh, yeah, if you're not a Pack a Day Podcast YouTube member, well, now's an even better time to sign up and I'll hook you up with some tickets to the game and to the Q&A as well. So let me know on that and just another great reason to be a member. So sign up right freaking now. All right. So as I mentioned, today's show is going to be doing my absolute best to build out a draft that makes logical sense for the Green Bay Packers. Now, before we get there, you know, and as I try to go through all of these scenarios, like I'm freaking Doctor Strange in the multiverse and trying to sort of piece together the puzzle pieces of, all right, when can you take this position? When can you take this? Of course, we want best player available. We want to get value, all those different things. But what I wanted to also sort of be cognizant of is what rounds can we sort of get players later? And what I mean by this is, is there something we absolutely have to attack in the first round? And I sort of went over it this way, that those positions of need that we know Green Bay has running back, offensive line, uh, you know, maybe corner a little bit, safety, linebacker. There's certainly some positions that Green Bay needs to address. Well, if they don't get those positions in the first round, can they still attack them later? Running back is clearly yes. There's not a first round running back. So the answer is obviously yes. You can find them. You're going to have to find them in rounds two or three or later. Uh, you know, for offensive line, can you find them in rounds two or three? Yes. At linebacker, can you find them in two or three? Yes. Safety, same thing. You know, corner becomes a little bit of a different situation, but in round two, yes. Round three, I think is going to become a little bit harder. But my point being here is I don't think we have to look at round one and say Green Bay has to come away with this position or they're screwed. I do think they could come away with all of their real specific needs, linebacker, safety, offensive line, and running back, just in rounds two and three alone with those four picks that they have, which could theoretically give them the versatility and just the ability to really truly take best player available at pick 25, or if they want to move up a little bit, maybe move down a little bit. I think they have the ability to do so. This isn't a roster that's completely devoid of talent, but there are some very significant needs. So as I go through this process, or as I went through this process, what was I trying to figure out here? Number one is, of course, always value. You don't want to not take best player available, and you don't want to undercut the value of the draft by reaching for needs. We know that Green Bay needs to come out of this draft with some specific positions. We just went over those but you can't have tunnel vision. You can't just go out and take players at positions of need and sacrifice better players at different positions to try to satiate those needs. And I think that is something that I was very cognizant of, or at least trying to be as I went through. So still trying to find the best value that I possibly could. Number two is, can we also do that by addressing some of those needs? And I think we're able to accomplish that in a lot of these drafts today. Also, don't be afraid to take chances you still want to come up with premium players. The, the goal of the draft is to try to find a player or two that are going to be franchise-altering players. They don't necessarily have to be Hall of Famers. They don't necessarily have to be all pros, 
but can you find a couple guys in this draft that legitimately can be franchise altering guys that can help you hopefully on the path to a Super Bowl? So you're going to sometimes have to take some chances. There's going to be some risk. You want a little of that baked into your draft because if you're just playing it safe, if you're just taking guys that have high floors but low ceilings, that's it's good to get good players. It's never bad to get good players. But if you don't get or at least try to get some great players, you might be undercutting your chances of really taking that next step as a franchise as you hopefully try to get back to a Super Bowl and hoist another Lombardi trophy. Number four, I wanted to keep options open. Again, I didn't want to get tunnel vision and say needs, needs, needs. I want to keep options open. If there's a player that falls that, you know, makes sense, maybe like don't make sense positionally, but it's just too good of a a player to pass up. Let's keep that option open. If there's a trade up scenario, if there's a trade down scenario, let's not limit ourselves again by what we think we need to take away and really, you know, lose track of what could be an amazing result for Green Bay by limiting our options. So keep options open. Number five, being cognizant of the strengths and weaknesses in this particular draft. We know that this isn't necessarily a great safety draft, a linebacker draft, a running back draft, and those are needs that Green Bay has. So how do we weigh that out and sort of find that sweet spot of where you can take those players that can come in and help, but not overreaching for them, knowing that they could go off the board quick. And if they do, specifically in the second and third rounds, and if they do, there's not left, uh, there's not a lot left to sort of get you back in the game at those particular positions. And then number six, how can we put together the most well-rounded draft possible that will help Green Bay both now and in the future? So those were the things that I was trying to accomplish as I went through these in all different scenarios. I used a bunch of different mock draft simulators and tried to figure out ways that we could put together this perfect draft. So seven different drafts. Let's start with number one. Number one, and I call this the basic the basic draft, we'll call it that. There's another swear word we could put after the the basic, uh, but the basic draft, draft that's going to hit the threshold. It's going to hit some needs, no trades. It's just your basic first, second, third round picks. And again, that's all I'm doing today is just rounds one through three. We're not going to go seven round on all of these. Once you get into the fourth through seventh, so many different things can happen and it could go in a variety of different directions. It's a hard enough process to just sort of try to figure out what we're going to do rounds one through three here. Uh, But we're going to limit it to one through three. And I'll just add one more thing. This isn't necessarily what I would do. In fact, one of these drafts is specifically like things that I really would not like. But I'm trying to put together a mix of how you put together a draft for some of these needs, what I think Green Bay could do, what would be some different scenarios that maybe Green Bay would take a look at. You'll see as we go through all this, but this isn't necessarily what I would do in all these occasions, although a lot of picks I do like throughout these drafts. But number one, the basic draft. All right, first pick, Cooper DeGene. This is a very mocked player to Green Bay. It's a very basic pick but it hits a lot of things that Green Bay is looking for specifically there at pick 25. I do think there's a possibility that he is there at 25. Is there a possibility he's gone? Yes. We talked about in the Cooper DeGene episode, it's not necessarily a perfect fit. He is a zone corner coming from Iowa. I think he plays much better going forward than he does turning and going backwards. Is he a safety? Is he a slot? Is he an outside guy? There's definitely a level of projection there. But what Cooper DeGene is, is a playmaker. He's a phenomenal football player, and he gives you that versatility. Outside corner, inside corner, safety, punt returner. They even used him a snap on offense. Like they, he's, he's that type of dude. So you get that versatility, and this also gives you options. If you don't get a safety later in the draft, well then, Cooper DeGene probably gets that nod as your starting safety. If you do get a safety later, all right, well, then he can compete on the outside. He could compete with Keyshawn Nixon. Again, you get a lot of versatility and a big-time player in Cooper DeGene. Pick 41, the first second rounder, I think going to be a very mocked player at this point at pick 41 for Green Bay, and that's Edgerrin Cooper. Hits all of those athletic thresholds. The need is at linebacker. They need to find somebody that can take away and come in and compete right away with Isaiah McDuffie. Cooper would immediately take that position, in my opinion. McDuffie then moves to a more natural number three linebacker, you know, behind both Cooper and Quay Walker. We can argue the Quay and Cooper fit next to each other, but Brian Gudekins literally defined it as he wants fast, physical guys that can do everything. And I feel like he's more trying to clone a player like Quay Walker than find maybe that balance of Quay's the fast, speedy, you know, sort of weak side linebacker and that you need a more physical run-stopping linebacker next to him. I don't think that's how Goody's going to see it. I think he, again, wants that versatility at the position. Edgerrin Cooper gives him that. 
Another fairly common mocked player here with the second, second round pick, Jaden Hicks. Now you got your box safety. And I've talked about this before. Jaden Hicks, really good player in pretty much any system. Phenomenal player as a box safety next to Xavier McKinney. To me, that unlocks the Jaden Hicks value. The fact that he doesn't have to play a high safety. The fact that he doesn't have to play a too high safety. The fact that he doesn't have to play a box safety with a really crappy you know, uh, post safety behind him. Being able to play his best position with an unbelievable player like Xavier McKinney behind him will completely unlock Jaden Hicks. I don't think it's completely different. It, it's different in like how they played and like the positions they played, but from a concept standpoint, I don't think it's completely different from when the Bears had Eddie Jackson and Adrian Amos. And it's, again, not apples to apples from a comparison standpoint, but the safety of Adrian Amos, meaning how safe and consistent and steady he was at that position, allowed Eddie Jackson to free range and do what he wanted and make a bunch of plays. And it's no coincidence that as soon as Amos left, Eddie Jackson saw his game fall off. And I think that is not, again, perfectly similar, but there's a similarity there where you unlock Jaden Hicks and take all of his box safety playmaking ability and bring it to the forefront because you have that tag team partner and Xavier McKinney. But you get that starting safety next to McKinney, which is a huge need. Pick four, uh, Dominic Puny. This is a, your offensive line pick. They don't have it yet. They go the first two rounds without picking an offensive lineman. Puny, in my opinion, is about a perfect situation in this scenario. And the reason I say that is he's a left tackle that's likely going to move inside, positional versatility, high-end athlete, but he's 24 years old. And in most drafts and in most scenarios and situations, that's frowned upon. That's not great. In this exact situation, it's kind of great. And the reason that I say that is you have now reached a point where you lost David Bakhtiari, you lost John Runyon Jr., you lost Yash Nyman, depth is a major issue, and you did not get any offensive linemen in the first or second rounds of the draft. You're now sort of on, okay, we need to find some depth, but it can't just be developmental depth. We need somebody who might be able to come in and play right now. And to me, that's where Puny comes in, 24 years old, developed. He's got a lot of playing time. Like I said, he played left tackle. In my opinion, he, he fits perfectly as a guard. He would come in and compete right away with Sean Ryan. I think this is a beautiful uh, round three pick for Green Bay. And again, gives them their offensive lineman that they're lacking. And then running back that I mentioned yesterday with, uh, with Perry and Dusty, Trey Benson. They get him in the final pick in the third round. This addresses that running back position, and it gives them a different flavor of running back. That speed back who can break a run at any given moment, high-end athleticism, would team very well with Josh Jacobs. And now you got Jacobs, Dylan, and a totally different flavor in Trey Benson. This fits a lot of different ways for Green Bay with these five players. So what did we accomplish with the first draft? We got a big time player in round one in Cooper DeGene with huge upside and tremendous versatility. We hit almost all of our positions of need. Cooper DeGene at corner, Edrin Cooper at linebacker, Jaden Hicks at safety, Dominic Puny at offensive line, and Trey Benson at running back. We got all of our needs, and that is a big time thing to be able to hit with our first five picks. And we got immediate help. Cooper DeGene is either going to come in and compete in the slot or probably compete at outside corner now that you have Jaden Hicks as well. But he's going to come in and compete and play right away. Edrin Cooper is going to be your starting linebacker. Jaden Hicks is going to be your starting safety. Dominic Puny, like I said, in my opinion, has the opportunity to beat out a Sean Ryan. Might even compete a little bit with Rasheed Walker. Might be able to play left guard if Josh Myers is the guy that's out. And maybe you put Elton Jenkins at center. A lot of variety there, but I think Puny comes in and competes right away. And Trey Benson, while not a starter, like I said, is going to be that change of pace from what Josh Jacobs and A.J. Dillon bring you. He's going to be able to contribute right away. So you get immediate help and contributions from all five players. Where we failed with this draft, only one offensive lineman and not until round three. I think you would have probably liked to address it a little bit earlier. Like I said, I really like Puny. I love the pick in, in round three there, but you only get one and you don't get one in the first two rounds. And then number two, the lack of premium positions. If Cooper DeGene does not play outside corner, you have not hit any premium positions. You've got DeGene maybe in the slot. Cooper is an off-ball linebacker. Hicks is a safety. Puny's likely an uh, interior offensive lineman. And Trey Benson's a running back. You didn't hit offensive tackle, defensive tackle, or defensive end, um, You know, edge rusher, corner, 
quarterback, not that they need it, but you didn't hit any premium positions. So there's a little bit of a downside there. Now let's jump to draft number two. This is my, uh, I'll label this one sort of like pap- Packers types within the realm of reality. So I think this is a very realistic draft for Green Bay with all the relative athletic scores and uh, high-end athletes that Green Bay loves. So realistic slash Packers types. This is draft number two. First pick, I know a lot of people don't like it. It's one that I've oft discussed here. Again, I'm not saying it's a perfect fit. I'm just saying I think he's going to be high on Green Bay's board, and I think it is a very realistic option here, and that's Tyler Guyton in round one. As we've talked about, and I'm not going to go super in-depth with it because we've talked about it on numerous occasions, the issue here, of course, is he's a right tackle, and that brings in the Zach Tom conversation of is he a guard, is he a center, do you want to move him off right tackle? I think the thing with Guyton is you probably need a little bit of time with Guyton anyway, which you can argue is maybe not the ideal use of a first-round pick. I understand it. I get it. But you get a very high-end athlete. You get a very high-end player at a premium position in Guyton. You can figure out the Zach Tom and movement of where you want to play players at a different date and time. But for now, you get a huge upside play at the offensive tackle position, which is a premium position. He hits all the athletic thresholds, hits pretty much everything for Green Bay. He's a little bit on the taller side, but I think that's a realistic option for Green Bay. So we're going to go with that one with pick one. First pick in the second round, Marshawn Neeland. Edge rusher, another player who hits everything that Green Bay likes. Is it a huge need? No, but premium position, high athletic score, could take over for Preston Smith if they want to move over or move on from him next offseason. You're still banking on LVN and Rashawn Gary being your big two guys moving forward, but you can never have enough pass rushers. And Neyland is a Packers prototype all day, every day. So they get him in round two. Next pick in round two, Chris Jenkins, same thing. Huge area of need here? No. Kenny Clark, TJ Slayton, free agents after this year. Colby Wooden still developing. Yeah, you like Carl Brooks. You still like Wyatt, but Wyatt's got a fifth-year option coming up. Grabbing another defensive tackle, even if it is more of that three technique that you kind of already have. Jenkins is very much a Packers type. You get a little bit more disruption in the middle of that defense. Another position you can never have enough of. And again, we know Green Bay loves those premium position players early in the draft. So they get Chris Jenkins in round uh, with their second pick in round two. We once again get Dominic Puny here in early round three to address the interior of the offensive line and again, give some competition to Sean Ryan. And then they get corner Jerry and Jones, a top 30 visit for Green Bay with that final third round pick. So what did we accomplish in this draft? We got premium positions. Goody's taking some home run swings here. You get an offensive tackle, you get an edge rusher, you get a defensive lineman, and you get a corner in this draft. So screw need, need be damned. We're going to get big time players at big time positions because that's what's going to ultimately win us football games the most. So we hit on some premium positions in this draft. Next, we hit athleticism. Relative athletic scores in this draft, 973, 908, 899-816-961. Everyone 8.16 or higher. Four of the five basically 9.0 or higher with uh, Jenkins coming in at an 8.99. This is a big time athletic draft at premium positions. Number three, you've got time to develop for these guys, meaning Tyler Guyton, probably a backup right tackle to Zach Tom on day one. Marshawn Neeland, probably that fourth edge rusher to begin behind Preston and Rashawn Gary and LVN. So you give him a little time to develop. Chris Jenkins, you've got him time to develop behind Devontae Wyatt, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, uh, TJ Slayton, and Kenny Clark. You don't necessarily need him to come in and and play immediately. Uh, Jerry and Jones at corner, even Dominic Puny, if you don't need him right away, you can start the five guys you already have along the offensive line. So you're giving this group a little bit more time to develop and not having to come in from day one. And then number four here is upside. Tyler Guyton, and this kind of comes with premium positions with high-end athleticism, you're getting some premium players at those premium positions that have the ability to develop into high upside players that, again, hopefully are players that can help drive you to that Super Bowl, hopefully in the near future. Where we failed in this draft, immediate impact. Guyton might not play right away. Nealon might be your number four edge rusher. Jenkins might be your number four, number five defensive lineman in the interior. Puny might not start right away. And Jerry and Jones might be more of a depth piece to begin with. So you don't get that immediate impact with this draft. Uh, you you don't always, uh, or in this one, you didn't address all of your needs either. You got no linebacker. You got no safety. You got no running back. 
Those are going to be huge areas of need on day three of the draft at this point. And also, I would say you have some risk here, too. Guyton's a bit of a risky play in round one. Nealon's a bit of a risky play in round two. And Jenkins is a bit of a risky play in round two. So high upside, premium positions, a lot of risk, and you really did not address your needs with that draft number two. All right, draft number three, what I like to consider a dream scenario. With pick one, you get Graham Barton at pick 25. With pick number two, this is something that I've been sort of saving a little bit and wanting to talk about. I think it might have to be in in the first round, but in this scenario that popped up, it was able to happen at pick 41. Pick 41 comes along. Denver doesn't get their quarterback in round one. All right. So Denver has no pick in round one or no quarterback pick in round one. And because at that point, the top quarterbacks are gone. Bo Nix and Michael Penix, probably not worth taking. I think Denver has pick 12, if I remember correctly, somewhere in that range. So they don't get Nix or Penix but they don't have a second round pick. This is something where I guarantee you uh, Denver's going to want to be looking for a quarterback and they don't have a second round pick. They don't have a second round pick. So what does Sean Payton do? Go back to New Orleans. This is the most unafraid coach to trade away future first round draft picks or future draft picks. In this scenario, Green Bay trades pick 41 with Bo Nix still on the board to the Denver Broncos They also give up their fourth round pick for this year. So 41 and their fourth round pick for the Broncos 2025 first round selection. You are getting the ultimate lottery ticket. It's Bo Nix and a skeleton roster that is not ready to compete right now in a division that has Justin Herbert and uh, Patrick Mahomes in that division right now on a team that has traded away and given away, like they're paying Russell Wilson a ton of money to not even be on the team. They traded away Jerry Judy. They're in bad shape. And like I said, it might take pick 25 to get this done. But if you can find a way that Denver's willing to give up their 2025 first round pick so that they can get one of their quarterbacks, you do it all day, every day. That might legitimately be pick number one next year. That's how valuable that pick could be. If not top five, maybe top 10, but it should have a ton of value. So if Sean Payton and the Broncos want to continue their string of doing incredibly stupid things, you trade pick 41 in this scenario and your fourth round pick from this year to the Broncos for their first round pick. They get their quarterback in Bo Nix. Green Bay picks up a future first. That's where we're going in this scenario. With their second, second round pick, they get Junior Colson, linebacker out of Michigan. Now we've talked about Edger and Cooper. In this case, they go Junior Colson, a little bit more of a physically imposing linebacker. Not as good in coverage. They didn't use him a ton in coverage. Not saying he can't do it, but they didn't use him a ton. Use him as a spy, use him as a blitzer. He's a really good run defender, can get sideline to sideline. Really great pairing with Quay Walker. Like that pick here. Jaden Hicks, they get with their first third round pick. We've talked about Hicks already. Then they get Jalen Wright at running back with their second third round pick. Bit of more of a, again, a dynamic playmaker who can pair with Jacobs, maybe AJ Dillon as well to address that running back position. What we accomplished, we got potentially a top five pick in 2025. And that is a dream scenario for me. You also get immediate impact. You get Graham Barton who can come in and play right away and probably starts at right guard for Sean Ryan or center for Josh Myers. You get Junior Colson, who will start at linebacker next to Quay Walker. You get Jaden Hicks, who will start at safety next to Xavier McKinney. And Wright will contribute as that change of pace running back next to Josh Jacobs. So you got a top five pick next year. You got players who can come in and make that impact. You hit your positions of need too. Running back, safety, linebacker, offensive line. All the big ones you hit with these picks and picked up a future first round pick from the Broncos. Like I said, it's a dream scenario. Where you failed, only one offensive lineman, and you did not get a corner. So there's a little bit of a failure there. Premium positions. We didn't really get our premium position. We might get one next year with that first round pick from the Broncos, but Graham Barton, probably an interior offensive lineman. Junior Colson, off ball linebacker. Hicks is a safety, and Jalen Wright at running back. So you didn't get those premium positions, and you are lacking in some high end upside here, meaning Graham Barton, I think, is going to be a really good guard. Uh, Junior Colson, potentially to be a nice off-ball linebacker. Hicks, a solid starting safety. Jalen Wright, really nice one-two punch at running back. But you might not be looking at that all-pro caliber player from this draft. But once again, you might just pick that up by getting a top five pick in the 2025 draft. All right, draft number four. I label this one, be aggressive, be, be aggressive. All right, so first, we are trading pick 25 and pick 58, our second, second round pick, to pick 16, trading with the Seattle Seahawks 
to get cornerback Quinion Mitchell. In this scenario, I thought Arnold would be there. Quinion Mitchell ended up being there, so he's the one that we get. I don't think Green Bay would be too picky in this scenario. If either Arnold or Quinion Mitchell were there at pick 16, I think that's where they start maybe having those discussions of trading up and getting in that conversation. In this scenario, they get one of the premium players in this draft at a premium position. He immediately starts opposite Jair Alexander. You love the different types of corners that you have in this scenario with Quinion Mitchell being a little bit bigger, a little bit more physical on the outside, Jair on the other side. Mitchell's a bit more of a projection and more of a uh, press and man corner situation. He played a lot of off-ball coverage at a smaller school, so there is some projection there. He did it at the Senior Bowl a little bit more and in Senior Bowl practices, and he did it well, meaning playing closer to the line of scrimmage. He fits. He fits all the athletic thresholds. This is a big-time move for Green Bay. They do give up that second, second-round pick, but they still have four in the top uh, five, or excuse me, four in the top 100. So they're aggressive in this scenario, but they get a big-time premium position player in Quinion Mitchell. Then, at pick 38, another big-time player is still sitting there. They use pick 41 and their fourth rounder to move up three spots to pick 38 and get Tyler Guyton at pick 38. I know a lot of people don't like Tyler Guyton at pick 25. Tyler Guyton at pick 38 is a pretty big time dream scenario here as well. Yes, you have to move up a few picks to be able to go get him, but now you've got a corner and an offensive tackle, big time premium positions with huge high end upside. You want to talk about taking a little bit of risk and maybe going for those all pro type caliber players. Well, getting Qu- uh, Quinion Mitchell and Tyler Guyton at picks 16 and 38, respectively. Yes, you give up a second and a fourth rounder in the process. That's going to hurt your draft a little bit this year, but you're going big game hunting and you do it by getting Quinion Mitchell and Tyler Guyton. Meanwhile, with pick uh, 88 in the third round, you get Trevin Wallace to address that linebacker position. And then in pick 91, you get Javon Bullard at safety to address that position. What did we accomplish? Huge upside with Mitchell and Guyton at premium positions. Immediate impact still. You've got Mitchell, who probably starts at corner opposite Jair. You get Wallace, who starts at linebacker. Bullard, Bullard, excuse me, to start at safety. And then theoretically, you could get Guyton to start at right tackle if you did want to move Zach Tom inside. But even if not, you get your swing tackle and first player up off the bench in Tyler Guyton. And you'd get, you know, in this scenario, you get a major secondary upgrade, right? You get Quinn Jan Mitchell in the first. You get Javon Bullard in the third. You've already added uh, Xavier McKinney. You brought back a Keyshawn Nixon and a Corey Ballantyne. You've really done a great job of upgrading that secondary for Jeff Halfley in his new defense. Where we failed, no interior offensive lineman, no running back, only four picks instead of five. Your fourth round pick is gone, so now you're not going to pick until uh, later on in the draft. And you lose some versatility here because... Quinion Mitchell, really only an outside corner, and Tyler Guyton, really probably only a right tackle. So you didn't give yourself a ton of flexibility and versatility there, but you gave yourself a ton of upside with drafting both of those players. All right, draft number uh, five, not 25, my goodness, I don't think I could do it. Uh, Draft number five, get more picks. So we're going to move down in this scenario. So the first situation here is we are trading down pick 25 to pick 37 and pick 69 they get in this trade. So 25 for 37 and 69. And at pick 37, they select Edrian Cooper. Then at pick 41, we're going to move down again. We're going to move 10 spots to pick 51 and pick up a third rounder and pick 98 in the process. By moving down, there's still a little bit of a risk with a player like this, but we're going to get uh, Kingsley Suomataea a offensive tackle who has all the upside in the world. Moving down a little bit gives you maybe a little bit more comfortability in taking a player like that in round two. Then with pick 58, they get Marshawn Nealon, the edge rusher we talked about. Now we've got four picks still remaining. With pick 69, we get Cooper Beebe, a really fun interior offensive lineman that's played some tackle and hits all the athletic thresholds. Pick 88, we get Trey Benson, the running back. Pick 91, we get Cole Bishop, the safety. And pick 98, we get Mason Smith, the big defensive tackle uh, who should help out on the interior. What did we accomplish? We got some big time depth and just, what, six different picks here. Edrian Cooper, Kingsley Suomataea, Marshawn Nealand, Cooper Beebe, Trey Benson, Cole Bishop, Mason Smith. I said six, I meant seven. We get a ton of depth competition, hit all of our needs. You get two offensive linemen, a running back, a defensive lineman, an edge rusher, a linebacker, a safety. There's a lot to like, and you're just getting more bites of the apple, more swings at the plate, whatever lame cliche you want to use. You also hit some premium positions. You got an edge rusher, an offensive tackle, a defensive lineman, and you still have some risk reward here, meaning Suomataea 
if he hits, is a big-time starting offensive tackle. Neyland, if he hits, is a big-time edge rusher. And Mason Smith, if he hits, is a really nice defensive tackle. So there's some risk with those players, but you definitely have some upside there. Where we failed, despite having seven picks, we couldn't find a single corner in this draft. Um, An immediate impact might be an issue as well. Yes, Edrian Cooper is going to come in and play right away. Uh, Cooper Beebe might have the option or probably will have the option of uh, competing for Sean Ryan at right guard. Trey Benson will help you a little bit as a rotational running back. Cole Bishop has the opportunity to start at safety, but Suamata Ea, Marshawn Neeland, probably not starters from day one. Beebe's going to have to compete for that right guard spot. Um, Again, Mason Smith is probably a rotational defensive tackle. So you are maybe getting some guys that don't have that immediate impact. And then there is some risk with this. Anytime you move down, it's less likely that you're hitting on those premium positions in round one. Now, Goot's been really good on day two of the draft, so you feel a little bit more comfortable, but there's always more risk than maybe taking some of the more safe bets in round one. Number six, we got two left. Draft number six is value slash, I didn't see that coming. All right, what do we end up with here? With our first pick, uh, we get Byron Murphy the second. Do I think Byron Murphy the second is going to be there at pick 25? No. If all of a sudden he's there at pick 25, do I think Green Bay would jump on it? Yes. It's not a huge position of need being that defensive lineman and, and really more of a three technique player who's more of a penetrating defensive tackle. But I do think he has some ability to hold up at the point of attack in the run game. That's not completely reminiscent to Kenny Clark. But if you are going to lose Kenny Clark to free agency next year, Byron Murphy goes a long way to replacing a player like that, even if they're not perfect apples to apples comparisons. This is a big time play for Green Bay to get a player of Murphy's caliber now and somebody who could help them a ton going into the future at that defensive line position. In round two, Kingsley Suamataea. Again, it's a little bit aggressive here. I don't love Suamataea because I think there's a lot of projection that takes place here. But as I've said before, coaches and GMs are going to fall in love with this player because when it looks good, it looks like you have a potential dominant starting tackle for the foreseeable future. A lot of work to do. Coaches and GMs are going to trust their offensive line coaches to get the most out of players like this. It's a very good type pick, high upside. So they get him in round two. The second pick around two is another one. Hey, didn't see that coming, but guess what? Let's draft a really good football player. Ennis Rakestraw. Now, does he hit all of Green Bay's thresholds? No, but does Goody take good players that he thinks are just good football players that maybe don't hit all the thresholds? Yeah, and Ennis Rakestraw hits that perfectly. I loved his game. I think he's a really fun slot corner in the NFL that can also play on the outside. He tackles aggressively. He brings a ton of energy. I love this pick. Again, does it hit everything Green Bay usually likes? No, but... Jaden Reed didn't either in the second round. And while they didn't work out as well, you know, somewhere right around this point too, Amari Rogers and and Jay Sternberger, he's willing to go outside of the thresholds. In my opinion, Rakestraw is worth doing that at this point in the draft. So didn't see that coming, but we'll take it. Same thing here, Jaden Hicks in round three. Do I expect him necessarily to be there in round three? No, but is it too good of a value to pass up on there? Yes. Then we took Johnny Wilson. Did I see that coming? No. Is it a bit overkill at wide receiver? Yes. But does he have upside in a play at the end of round three? You bet. So that's what we got. Not the draft that I think a lot of people are expecting, but one where if, hey, things fall to you, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Is that a real thing? Am I from the 1950s? Uh, Who's to say? But in this case, we get some really good value, some really good players. What we accomplished in this draft, big time value in Byron Murphy and Murphy, Rakestraw, and Hicks should all come in and have immediate impact for this team. Where we failed, no running back no linebacker, and only one developmental offensive lineman, meaning you don't get somebody who can maybe even come in and play right away in Suamata'ea, so you have some serious needs going into day three. Johnny Wilson's probably overkill at wide receiver, and Rakestraw doesn't fit their usual athletic profile. And then our last draft here, draft seven, what I call realistic 2.0. This is a draft that I feel could very easily go down this way meaning it's not necessarily completely predictive, but if you told me this was Green Bay's draft, I would 1 million percent believe you. All right, pick one, Cooper DeGene. We talked about this in our opening draft. A lot of versatility, a little bit of a projection here from Green Bay, but a big-time playmaker and a big-time player that they get in round one. Jordan Morgan to open up round two. Morgan, not specifically my cup of tea, but They get a big time versatile offensive lineman who could probably play some tackle, probably play some guard. In my opinion, needs to be worked up from the ground up a little bit with his technique, but you get a big time uh, offensive talent here. 
This gives me a little bit of Jason Spriggs type vibes. Um, just knowing that again, he's got all the athleticism and upside, but there's just some stuff on tape that makes you a little bit wary, but I think Green Bay will be extremely interested in Jordan Morgan. Peyton Wilson with the second, second round pick. This is another player that gives me a little bit of nervousness because I think this is one of those high end athletes that doesn't necessarily have the instincts and, um, you know, just overall linebacker play that I'd kind of be hoping for at this spot. But this is another player I highly expect Green Bay to be engaged with and involved with and potentially taking at this point in the draft. Mason Smith, same thing. Not my cup of tea in this draft. Not a player that I love. But this is one of those where they don't make many 6'5", 310-ish, 305, 310 defensive tackles. This is going to be a player that Green Bay is interested in. Top 30 visit for them. And at this point in the draft, even though his tape was left you wanting for more, especially coming off. This is his first year coming off. I think it was an ACL injury, his sophomore season. Um, you, the hope is that he bounces back and plays even better in his second year coming off that big injury. And again, they just don't have many players like this in the draft. So somebody I think Green Bay would be super interested in in uh, with their first third round pick. And then a player we've talked about already, Dominic Puny. They get him with their final third round pick. What we accomplished in this draft a ton of versatility. Cooper DeGene can play a variety of defensive back positions. Jordan Morgan, a variety of offensive line positions. Peyton Wilson, he's going to be an off-ball linebacker for Green Bay, but I think you might actually be able to use him a little bit as an edge rusher from time to time as well. And then Dominic Puny gives you some versatility really along the offensive line, tackle guard, um, probably left or right side as well. So you get a ton of versatility in this draft. You get immediate impact. DeGene should play right away. Morgan will have the opportunity to compete at either probably right guard or left tackle. Peyton Wilson is going to start at linebacker. Mason Smith's going to be a rotational defensive lineman. And Puny might have that ability to compete with Sean Ryan or Rashid Walker as well. So I think you get some immediate impact here in this draft. And you do get some high-end upside. No question about it. Cooper DeGene has high-end upside as a defensive back. Morgan has it along the offensive line. And uh, Mason Smith, even along the defensive line. And then you have Peyton Wilson, who, if he hits his upside, might be the best linebacker in the draft. And Puny, who I, again, think the world of and think could be a really legitimate starting guard. So a lot of upside in this draft as well. Where we failed, no running back. Did you get a safety that can play next to Xavier McKinney? Because if Cooper DeGene is not a safety, you didn't. And even if he is, is he a perfect fit next to McKinney? He might not be. And then you get some risk here as well. Cooper DeGene is, a, again, we talked about it earlier, a bit of a projection in this defense. Jordan Morgan's a developmental player. Peyton Wilson's had some injuries. Smith had poor tape a season ago. So you're taking some risk. And even Puny, you're projecting going from tackle to guard a little bit. So there's a lot of risk with this draft. All right, those are my seven drafts. Just to sort of recap it here. Draft one, Cooper DeGene, Edrin Cooper, Jaden Hicks, Dominic Puny, and Trey Benson. Draft two, Tyler Guyton, Marshawn Neeland, Chris Jenkins, Dominic Puny, and Jerry and Jones. Draft three, Graham Barton, a future Broncos first round pick, Junior Colson, Jaden Hicks, and Jalen Wright. Pick four, trade up for Quinion Mitchell, trade up for Tyler Guyton, Trevin Wallace, and Javon Bullard. Draft five, trade down for Edgerin Cooper, trade down for Kingsley Suamataea, and then get Marshawn Neeland, Cooper Beebe, Trey Benson, Cole Bishop, and Mason Smith in that draft. Um... And then draft six, Byron Murphy the second, Kingsley Suamataea, Ennis Rakestraw, Jaden Hicks, and Johnny Wilson. And draft seven, Cooper DeGene, Jordan Morgan, Peyton Wilson, Mason Smith, and Dominic Puny. Would love to know which one is your favorite. Which one did you like the best? Which one did you like the worst? Are there any that you, or did you just not like all of them? Let me know your thoughts. Would love to hear it if you're on the YouTube channel. So let me know in the comments below. My favorite draft of all of these was number three, the dream scenario. You get Graham Barton, you get the Broncos first, first round pick, which I, like I said, I think is going to be a potential top three pick next year. Junior Colson to pair next to Quay Walker, Jaden Hicks to pair next to Xavier McKinney, and then a playmaking running back in Jalen Wright. Give me that one of all of them. It's not perfect. I, I, It's not perfect. I'll put it that way. I don't think any of these are perfect, but I think all of them give you an idea of how Green Bay might be able to shape this draft. There's a ton of different scenarios. There's a bunch of players we didn't discuss that are going to be high on Green Bay's boards. You know, Graham Barton, Cooper DeGene, all it takes is, you know, one team to take them in front of Green Bay at 25 in these scenarios. Uh, some of them go out the window. Byron Murphy, same thing. A lot of these guys could be gone. It's an imperfect science. We're trying to do our best. 
My point here was not to predict it perfectly. My point here was not to just draft guys that I like. My point here was to give a variety of different scenarios of how Green Bay could piece together the puzzles of this draft to come away with a well-rounded group of players that hopefully provide some upside, that hopefully get some of those positions of need filled and don't really include reaches and still trying to get a lot of that value. So again, let me know which draft you like the best. That's going to do it for me today. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Dad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, Dan Miller, and Alex Wang. I'll see you tomorrow. Until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.